Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jennifer Roberts. I am the Johnson Kulakundis Family Faculty Director of the Arts here at the Radcliffe Institute. Before we begin today's program, I want to take a moment to acknowledge all the members of the Radcliffe Institute Leadership Society and all our annual donors who are watching this afternoon. Your generosity keeps Radcliffe programming free and open to the public, and we thank you. I'm thrilled to welcome you to the opening event for our first contemporary art exhibition of the year, which also happens to be our first ever online art exhibition. It's an exhibition that explores the aesthetic and political possibilities of female friendship by exploring the art of two extraordinary women, Marilyn Pappas and Jill Slosberg Ackerman. It's organized by Meg Rotzel, the brilliant and dedicated curator of exhibitions here at Radcliffe, whom you will meet shortly. Now the Radcliffe Institute promotes art as a form of advanced study and engagement by commissioning and curating art that reaches across disciplines and across communities, both within and beyond Harvard. This exhibition marks the 60th anniversary of the Bunting Institute. For those of you that don't know about the Bunting Institute, it was essentially the forerunner of today's Radcliffe, named for the president of Radcliffe College, Mary Ingram Bunting. It was a postgraduate study center for women scholars and artists that provided time, financial and institutional support, and membership in a vital community of women. Pappas and Slosberg Ackerman were both Bunting Institute fellows in the 1980s. Now, when this exhibition was first conceived, we of course expected it to happen in the Contemporary Art Gallery on Radcliffe's campus. Once the pandemic hit, however, we moved the exhibition online. Moving an exhibition online is not a simple thing, and I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge Joe Zane, the exhibition director at Radcliffe. He did a beautiful job at designing the virtual exhibition and conceiving of many of its best features. You can access the virtual exhibition at www.onviewatradcliffe.org, and that link will be coming up in the chat window if it isn't there already. On that site, you'll be able to view galleries of the artist's work including a panorama of the two artists' studios. Listen to audio interviews with the artists conducted by Shruti Venkata, a Harvard College junior, and sign up to receive the publication with an essay by author Anya Ventura. The site has many other features, and there will also be monthly Zoom tours available to the public. In tonight's program, over the next hour, we'll learn about Jill and Marilyn's friendship through a conversation with the artists and Maggie Doherty, author of the book, The Equivalence, a story of art, female friendship, and liberation in the 1960s. Maggie's book is a history of the first class of female artists and their influential friendships at the Bunting Institute. We're honored to have her with us tonight. Then we'll be digging deeper into the artworks and the artist's process during a conversation with Meg Rotzel. And you'll be able to submit your questions at any time during the program for a Q&A with the artists at the end of the hour. So now to get us started, I'd like to pass the Zoom speaker view to my colleague, Meg Rotzel, who will introduce us to the exhibition that she has so beautifully organized. Meg. Thank you, Jennifer, and welcome everyone. I am pleased to be with you this afternoon and to share space with artists Marilyn Pappas and Jill Slisberg Ackerman and author Maggie Doherty. And before we dive in, I'd like to tell you a little more about the origins of the show. Um, Jill and Marilyn initially met at Mass College of Art in 1974 and were both fellows at the Radcliffe's Bunting Institute. They were part of the founding group of the Brick Bottom Artists Association, which built one of the first artist-developed live-work buildings. They've worked in adjoining studios for more than 30 years. I met Jill almost 15 years ago and then consequently Marilyn. I was hired five years ago to oversee Radcliffe's exhibition program. And during my first week at work, I discovered one of Marilyn's artworks on the wall in the Dean's office. And a little while later, a box was delivered to my office with one of Jill's artworks inside. As the anniversary of the Bunting Institute approached, the idea of how this, how this show um, began, it began to form. I was fortunate to meet Maggie. More than a year ago, she was finalizing her book and I felt a new friendship growing between us. I mentioned this tree of relationships 
now, um, now more than ever, I've become aware of the roots and the fruits of friendship. I met Anya Ventura, SES for the exhibition 10 years ago. This show also grew out of an ongoing and intentional discussion between us of women and friendship. In Anya's essay, she notes that in friendship, we see a model of collectivity that is based not in family or state, but in natural affinities, a mode of exchange that offers the potential for liberatory politics. Mm -hmm. I certainly have felt this to be true in my life. And truer now as our social relations have changed under the circumstances of the pandemic in this new administration. And it's here that I think of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and how her life's work has impacted women in this moment so much. And before we begin, I'd like to say a little bit about the image that you see on your screen. It was created for this exhibition by both artists. It's titled, Accompanied, Two Views of the Sea. The drawing was made by Marilyn and the frame by Jill and the frame surrounds and supports the image. The image gives the center to the frame. Both elements look to the sea for subject matter and sit along each, aside each other in contrast and harmony. And now I'm pleased to share the accomplishments of our presenters. Marilyn Pappas is based in Somerville, Massachusetts. She creates large scale textile works developed from sculptures of ancient goddesses. The three-dimensional figures stand at the intersection of sculpture and garment and imagine ancient artworks as they evolve and survive over centuries. Although broken, faded, and disintegrating, the works are metaphors for the strength and power of women in the Me Too era. Her work has been exhibited in many galleries and museums during the course of her over 60-year career, including the Courier Museum of Art, the De Cordova Sculpture Park and Museum, the De Young Museum, Fuller Craft Museum, the Hazley Institute of Contemporary Art, the HUB Robeson Galleries at Pennsylvania State University, Craner Art Museum, the Museum of Art and Design, the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, and the Staten Island Museum. She is Professor Emeretta at the Massachusetts College of Art and Design, where she taught from 1974 to 1994. Jill Slusberg Ackerman, is based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Her metaphysical hybrid wood sculptures, installations, and drawings are made from discarded furniture, sawdust, and wood scraps, and they emanate from an examination of natural forms and phenomena. Originally from Omaha, Nebraska, she is inspired by the pragmatism of the pioneers who settled the Great Plains, material culture, and the history of art. Her work has been exhibited in numerous galleries and museums, including at the Cohen Art Center at Tufts University, Concord Center for the Visual Arts, the Cummings Art Galleries at Connecticut College, the De Cordova Sculpture Park and Museum, the Fuller Craft Museum, the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, the Nightingale Brown House at Brown University, the Rose Art Museum, UMass Dartmouth, and the Worcester Art Museum. She too is a professor emeritus at the Massachusetts College of Art and Design, where she taught from 1974 to 2018. Her book, Restless Shelves, Psychophant, is forthcoming. And now Maggie Doherty. She is the author of The Equivalence, a story of art, female friendship, and liberation in the 1960s. It was published by Knopf earlier this year. She is a literary scholar, historian, and critic based at Harvard, where she earned her PhD in English and where she currently teaches writing, literature, and history. Her writing has appeared in many publications, including The New Republic, The New York Times, N Plus One, and The Nation. She also lives in Somerville, Massachusetts. And before we go any further, I encourage those watching on Zoom to use the Q&A feature to submit your questions anytime during the program, and we will address as we can. Since we anticipate a lot of questions, we ask that you keep them short, and this will increase the likelihood that we can address as many as possible in the time that we have. And now it's my pleasure to pass the virtual floor to Maggie. 
Thank you so much, Meg. Um, and thank you to everyone at the Radcliffe Institute for putting on this amazing exhibition. And thank you especially to Jill and Marilyn for including me in this exciting conversation about art and friendship and women and institutions, all things that are endlessly fascinating to me. Um, so I thought we might start our conversation, and maybe this is just because it's the beginning of the school year, I have teaching and learning on the brain, with a little bit of discussion about teaching and learning as friends. Um, Marilyn, I was really struck when I was listening to these beautiful and fascinating interviews that both of you gave that are part of the exhibition by something you said about being at the Bunting Institute and feeling that you were getting a liberal arts education from the other fellows. And I was so struck by this because I was thinking as a teacher and you're both teachers, how different it is to be learning from or, or teaching in some way to peers, people who are your equals. So Marilyn, could you talk a little bit about how you feel as a teacher um, when you're learning from people who are your colleagues, your peers, and maybe even from Jill specifically? Well, my year uh, at the Bunting was wonderful. Uh, it was like getting a, a liberal arts education because every week there was a, some sort of a seminar uh, and all of the fellows were uh, in different fields. So we had a chance to hear formal lectures, but then also since we were all working in studios and uh, rooms close to each other, we could also learn informally from them. And uh, it was a wonderful experience. Uh, I loved it. I wish it could have <laughs> continued. I felt as though I had a benevolent patron while I was there. And I think it is, it's very different from learning um, in a teaching situation. And it's also different from learning uh, from Jill. Uh, Jill and I have had hundreds of conversations about our work and everything else that you can possibly think of. And uh, being so open with each other has allowed us to always have someone to talk to. And having studios so close to each other has has made that a really interesting way to to carry on a friendship and to learn from it in an informal way. Yeah, Jill, I'm curious, does that mirror your experience as well about how different it is to be learning from peers as opposed to being in a formal classroom setting or even to be teaching peers as opposed to being a teacher of students? Absolutely the same uh, as what Marilyn said. The thing that I also would add is that there's uh, something about being in a collective, wh whether it was at the Bunting or a smaller collective with Marilyn, is it's not threatening. You don't have to prove yourself and you don't have to feel like a fool. Um, for not knowing something. And one of the things about the bunting when I was there, probably for everybody, is that people aren't directly teaching. They're really, there's dialogue, they're examining things. And so people are in the process of learning something new or posing new questions. And so it's more of being witness to the liveliness of encountering an endeavor or a, a field of study. And I think that happens in the studio too, when artist to artist. That's such a lovely way of putting it, the encountering. Um, I wanna talk a little bit more about the studio because one of my favorite things about this exhibition is how much of the studio is in it, how much of um, images of both of your studios, your shared kitchen. It really kind of reminds us of these spaces in which art and thought and knowledge are made. 
And this is also something that um, Anya Ventura picks up on in her catalog essay, the importance of a studio, or we could even just think of it as a separate space, especially for women, a space where you can go and get away from domestic responsibilities, other parts of life that often get in the way or interrupt creative work. And this often has a kind of feminist significance for, for many um, female artists, the idea of having this separate space, having a studio. So maybe, Jill, could you, could you talk a little bit about the way you have understood, and maybe it's changed, your relationship to feminism as a, as a creative woman? How did you ever think about, or how did you think about your art in relation to feminism? or even just yourself as, a, as an artist, as someone with this creative life, did that feel like a feminist project to you at different times? I have to say, I always felt entitled to my own room. So when feminism became a terminology, it was familiar to me, but I didn't have to fight for it the way women, even a generation before me, had to. So it, I expected it, or I expected that I was going to make it for myself. I think that uh, Marilyn and I were talking about this this weekend, is that sometimes feminism in art was jarring, that the, the kind of rhetoric, the kind of representation was more overt in terms of expression than uh, I had really encountered in art school. And I went to art school in the late 60s. So we were really more involved with minimalism and ab abstraction than the idea of feminist art. I think what was really important for me about feminism in art was that the subject could be broader than what, what I first encountered. Um, a history painting was really very different from what one would look like now. So there was a familiarity, but it wasn't really hard for me to work toward. How about you, Marilyn? How has your relationship to feminism evolved as an artist? Well, I think the first um, time I really uh, was conscious of the whole feminist um, revolution was during the 60s. And I was already doing everything that feminists were fighting for. I was a teacher, I was an artist, uh, I was a mother. I was a wife, then I became a single mother. So it wasn't a battle I was waging. As I look back uh, over my whole career, uh, I think that the only way I really felt I was not uh, up to par or I wasn't uh, on a level with my male counterparts was in my salaries. And um, that was always something that bothered me. Uh, and I hope it's better today. Yeah, R rightly so. It, se it seems definitely like something that would, <laughs> would rankle and still does. Um, it's such an interesting, your, your comment, Marilyn, reminds me of speaking to some artists around your generation who describe themselves as self-liberated and pre-liberated before women's lib. This was our, I was already doing the thing on my own. Um, I want to go back, Marilyn, to something you were saying earlier about informality. It reminds me of something Jill was saying in one of her interviews about the sort of serendipity of your friendship. Um, and I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about what it's like to work alongside each other. Um, so you have these two studios next to each other. And how does that change your friendship or your working relationship to have each other so near? Well, I think it brought us closer. 
uh, we were already good friends, uh, but having a studio right on the other side of the wall from Jill uh, made it possible to speak to her about anything. And uh, we were there for each other during our personal lives and we were there for each other uh, helping each other solve art problems, critiques, and we didn't get angry or upset at each other. I think uh, the best thing about our relationship has been this constant um, feeling that we're always there for each other. We respect each other. So this has been helpful. I mean, sometimes I've asked Jill to look at my work and sometimes I say, I think this is finished now. And she looks at it. She's a really good uh, critic. Uh, and she might not think it's finished. And even though I don't want to hear what she <laughs> says, um, after she says it, I do, I can go back and think about it. Sometimes I agree with her and sometimes I don't, but it's really wonderful having that kind of um, friendship mm -hmm. right there on the other side of the wall. Jill, I wonder, is it ever challenging to have each other that nearby? I guess I'm just what I'm imagining, being in a moment of sort of creative intensity and hearing a knock on the door. Are there any challenges to having that kind of proximity? Not yet. <laughs> you know, 30 years you know it's I I would may I add a, a few things is that there's a certain formality in our our time in the studio we're not always there at the same time I tend to be nocturnal and Marilyn less so but the wall is there a, a little bit like Robert Frost's good a wall makes a good neighbor we are rather formal mm. we don't just flop into each other's space there's a corridor we could come and go and not see each other if we didn't want to but uh if we want to find out what the other one is thinking we'll say when you have a minute could you look please and then there are other times when we are extremely social the thing I'd like to add is that being next to Marilyn means that I'm living with a retrospective exhibition. So I have had the privilege of seeing her work evolve for 30 years. And there are pieces in the studio that were made even before we moved into Brick Bottom. So uh, there's the ability to understand it's almost like a shorthand when she shows me something she's working on or something new or thinking about something I already know all this other work and I have this sense of what could come next what the connections are and this I think the same thing happens for me so there's this um well as I, I said retrospective which brings a very deep understanding, not just about the work that was made, but about the possibility of what comes next. I love this idea of evolution and constancy at the same time, that, mm -hmm. there's, a that there's the longevity allows for both that kind of consistency, constancy, security, at the same time, a certain amount of change and dynamism which, which brings me to, I think, maybe our last question for, about friendship, which is how have the two of you maintained this constancy in the midst of all of life's upheavals and changes? I guess I'm thinking of this especially now as the pandemic forces us often to let go of other relationships. We might be quarantined with children and partners and maybe we're seeing colleagues, but often friends are the people we're struggling to see. It's hard to justify or find ways to access our friends. So how, how have you two done it? How have you, all, how have you made sure to keep each other present and be present for each other um, over the last several decades? 
Um, Jill, would you maybe start with that? It wouldn't be my life if, if I didn't talk to Marilyn every day. It just became um, a part of the life. And, and if it's not a phone call now, it might be a text. But I don't know, Maggie. That's such a good question. Um, I think that it's organic. Mm. Um, there have been times when, especially Marilyn traveled more than I did, we, we would write letters. We might send emails, but there, there has been, as you say, a constancy. And then if there are times when there are absences, they're never questioned. Mm. Marilyn, how, how do you think about maintaining this friendship? I'm well, always I'll tell you what, any, any tips for <laughs> any tips and tricks for keeping the people you love in your life? Uh, I'll tell you one thing that happened since the pandemic started. Uh, we wanted to be able to still uh, have a friendship and uh, in the same place. And so I called my doctor early on and explained to her what was going on and asked her if she thought it would be okay if we sheltered in place together. And she did, I mean, which didn't mean we lived together, but we could get together, which was really important because we are both recently widowed and we would have been very alone. Mm -hmm. So that was important, but it's always uh, been important. And as Jill said, sometimes we didn't see each other for a long time because one of us was away, but we, we always felt as though we could communicate with each other. And, and that's a very special thing. It, re it really is. I think this idea of sheltering together actually is a very beautiful image to me of what friendship and this kind of friendship might mean to sort of shelter with each other in the world, no matter what is happening in it. Well, this has been so beautiful and lovely. I want to turn the conversation now to the art. And to do that, I'm going to turn the floor back over to Meg to talk a little bit more deeply about both of your artwork. Hello there. Um, thank you, Maggie. And thank you, Marilyn and Jill, for that conversation. It is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, it's always a joy to listen to your stories and I want to let the audience know that on our website for the exhibition, we have these oral histories, um, kind of these a view in conversation with each other and then also um, about your own artwork. So you can, everybody at home, you can um, learn much more. And before we talk about the artwork that you contributed to the exhibition, I understand that you both want to acknowledge some people. Um, how about you go first, Marilyn, and then you, Jill? Uh, all right. Uh, I would like to particularly thank my longtime assistant, Liz Newman. She's been with me for over 20 years. And I truly think that I could not have done all the work I've done without her assistance. So thank you, Liz. Thank you. How about you, Jill? Uh, first of all, uh, we both want to acknowledge the passing of uh, Dana Pellegrini. She was a founder, founding, another founding mother of Brick Bottom and uh, a, a spectacular cabinet maker and eventually became a fabricator for both of us. There was a big friendship as well and Dana died two weeks ago and oh, we, we miss her and we are grateful for her life on earth and for how she helped us realize the dreams we had for our work. And then we also want to recognize and thank the entire Radcliffe team for all of the work and organization that went into this huge project and especially to Meg who is a visionary. 
her idea about how to make this work is so appropriate at this moment. And it's been a joy and a privilege and an honor. So thank you all and thank you, Meg. Jill, that warms my heart. Um, and, and I think that working at, as we have throughout, so the last six months, what we've done is made this show together. And I think that it is knitted us together beautifully. And I really appreciate that. Um, so that's very kind, thank you. Um, and I'm gonna encourage everybody uh, to visit the show following this discussion to see images of the artwork that we'll mention. Um, and I also wanna remind you that you can incorporate, you can submit questions. Um, First, Jill, I'm gonna speak with you and then Marilyn, and then um, I will incorporate some of the questions that I see coming in um, from the audience throughout. So um, Jill, we met for the first time in your studio. And I think about this often now that when I entered, I felt like I couldn't see anything. And then I felt like maybe I could see everything all at once. And it was thrilling. And I really think about this moment as my first step into being a curator. And I appreciate that so much, Jill. And let, I'll begin here. So I've been, I think that this has something to do with seeing everything all at once. So I'm really drawn to how you join, as you say, your disparate and opposing elements nature, artifice, art design, and craft into hybrid sculptures. Can you tell me a little bit more about joining and hybridity? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I'm going to explain this really talking about literature because I think that language gives me tools for this idea. When I was a jeweler, the, the ideas from my work started and they continue, which is how do you ever know something? And there's so many ways of knowing something and how do things come together to make sense? So the idea of bringing together things that are opposite, things which are contradictory, that's been my project and it's a way to try to understand how the world operates or to make some suggestions about a better way to operate. And the literature part comes, or the literary, not literature, the literary comes from things, my favorite word is and. It's not, I like you, but you're this way. It's I like you and you were that way. So I'm always bringing parts of things which seemingly don't go together and my project is to mediate them and I like making things this is one of the things about art making something real out of nothing or scraps or transformation so with this idea of or this question or wondering about things I feel like I'm making palpable visual paragraphs, sentences, maybe even a sonnet, which take on that project. Yes, I definitely, that, that really um, rings true to me, especially with the way that you, like one, it, there's rhyming going on for sure. There's one thing and another thing together. And then you can also see through your work how, um, particularly in your studio, how there's a form that happens over here and that form gets repeated. And um, that is, as a curator, something I love to think through. And particularly, I'm so glad that we have these panoramas of the studios because you can see this almost rhythm happening throughout time in your work and then even within the sculptures themselves. And so this actually brings me to the artwork that we've, um, that's in the gallery, um, Blasfeld, Riedfeld, Slosberg, Ackerman, an illustration, Eminent Collapse and Ascent. So I was wondering if you could talk about, I mean, that, that in itself is this long title and it has like punctuation in it. So tell me about that. 
uh, the title evolved over time. Mm -hmm. And my work evolves over time. And what you might not know is that I worked on that for about five or six years. It started with what I call mother drawing. Mm -hmm. And it's a little collage of a work of Blasfeld and a work of Rietveld. Now, uh, Rietveld was a designer and an architect. And his work is known by its geometry it's hard edge. And Blasfeld was actually a sculptor who wanted, uh, who, who got known for his photography, not for his sculpture. And the photography had to do with capturing nature. He was bringing plant material to his classes in Germany, and he was frustrated because it was changing. <laughs> so he uh, took photographs to, to help his students make drawings. And I was interested in the nature, these beautiful black and white photographs that he made for his students. So I was juxtaposing something. Ex also, you know, one is nature, an image, and the other was a, is a desk. It's a credenza. And so something functional, completely geometric. And what I started with was... A, a piece of furniture. It was, it's an arts and crafts uh, drop front desk that I found in pieces on the street in Somerville. And somehow that was the very beginning of trying to figure out how to put this thing that was falling apart back together or how it could become a sculpture. And I looked to that little collage I'd made long before I found the piece of furniture. And then it became a lot of problem solving about what happens at a desk. And so, and also the, the kind of pixelated cloud that hovers over was, I think, um, a way of talking about disintegration and um, just forgot the word, um, a, a, a kind of dispersal, mm -hmm. um, which is floating. So the idea of something that's falling down, the idea of something that is rising became really interesting to me because of those contradictions. And eventually there was a platform and eventually there was a horizon line so that I built a very quiet place and the question is, is it falling down or is it being held together? And I was really interested in bringing all of that together. It evolved over time. I couldn't have told you in advance that uh, the work would look that way. One thing led to another and eventually I was able to stop. That I, I understood the end and I will say that my work often incorporates pieces of furniture that other people have thrown away because I'm really, it's poignant. And, mm -hmm. and furniture in general has, has a subject matter. Uh, so, so that's something I'm familiar with in that cloud. At first it was cut pine, very severely cut pine. And eventually I started incorporating my own scraps. So there's a kind of history of the world there and a history of my own making which makes that work. Yeah. And I think that um, that scrap, that, 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 um, that hybridity is like right in there, but also that hybridity um, is about time. And then I, I just, there's another work that's on the website that has the, is it the secretary, I think? But I, this idea of the literary really. Um, oh, the amanuensis. Amanuensis. Yeah. 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 So Jill, I look forward to our, um, the tour that we're going to do online. Um, so we can speak more about this with, uh, public. Um, so, but now I'm going to move on to Marilyn. Um, thank you for that. So Marilyn, uh, we have talked about your travels. Um, Jill has mentioned that you've traveled a lot, and um, I know that you have traveled to the Mediterranean a number of times. 
and that travel has deeply affected your work. Can you tell me about these trips and how they've influenced you? Well, I've, I've always loved to travel, but I actually never traveled outside the country until I was 35 years old. And then I went to Mediterranean countries and fell in love with the, the long-standing culture uh, of these countries and cities. Uh, uh, things from all different periods are there, uh, standing next to each other, even on top of each other. Uh, and I loved seeing that combination of uh, various centuries. And uh, also I, I began to look at classical art in a way I had never really thought about it. Uh, looking at classical architecture uh, and then at sculpture, at paintings. Uh, so I, I would collect as I, as I traveled and, and sometimes I would make collages too as I traveled but I would collect the ephemera of my travels, the tickets, the maps, the uh, papers of, and photographs, and would come home and, uh, and put them in collages. That's the way I started working with my travels. Uh, and I had worked with fabric and thread all through the, um, from the mid 60s to about the late 70s. And then um, I got more interested in collages and also uh, I was teaching full time and um, I found that the spontaneity of, of collage uh, worked well. But when I got near retirement, I really wanted to go back to working with cloth and thread, but I wasn't sure how to do uh, how to do that because my early works were uh, collages utilizing clothing pieces. Mm -hmm. So I I took this interest of classical sculpture and gradually zeroed in on the classical sculptures of goddesses, women especially. And I began to use that as an inspiration uh, for my work. I didn't yeah. really reproduce them, but I, I began with them. That, that brings me actually to my next question. Um, because this work that you've been doing, um, it's been ongoing for, as I understand it, 20 years. And I'm really interested in the title of your ongoing series, but your most recent series, Nevertheless, She Persisted. And I just, I wanna know more about the beauty and the brutality that coexists in these artworks. That um, when people go and see this exhibition, they'll see that the, sculptures that you're referring to you you're not like there's like some don't have heads or arms or legs and yet there's this power within them can you talk a little bit about that uh yes because that's very important um to me because when i would look at these sculptures in museums uh they would be as you say perhaps without arms, a battered breast. And, but you look at them in that condition and you say, oh, isn't that beautiful? And it is beautiful. And it has always been sort of metaphorical for me that uh, we, we think of beauty as being something perfect, but in fact, it's not. Uh, I'm interested in the beauty of imperfection, or I guess you could say the imperfection of beauty. Uh, and I, I've tried to honor that and develop my work with that idea that all of us are imperfect. And hopefully, even though we are imperfect and aging, I'm very conscious of aging now, uh, that there can still be 
a really interesting uh, and beautiful part of it. So it's rather, I think there's a poetry of, of imperfection, really. Yeah, I definitely see that in that work. And when I see the, just the title of persistent, like, nevertheless, you persisted, that um, it was so resonant last year, the year before, and now even more so that looking at those are just, I don't know, they, they're just so powerful. And I deeply appreciate them, like deeply. Um, and I'm, I've been looking at the questions coming in and um, a few people have, I think this might be a combined question. Mindy has asked this one. And I think this is asked of both of you um, that there's a few questions that relate to the relationship between you two and your artwork. And one is about the formal and conceptual aspects of your work. Um, I think it's like, does Jill, like because of you being together, does Jill's artwork look like Marilyn's or the other way around? Um, I have never thought that I've seen a direct formal correlation because I've really thought of like, Jill's, I think after we've discussed, like Jill's is literary and becoming, and Marilyn, I feel like yours is very like, it tells a story. So I guess, do you think that your long-term proximity affect your artwork, the formal aspects of your artwork? How about Marilyn, you take that one? Uh, yes, I think it does. Uh, I think everything, Everything we do or say affects each other in some way. And even though our artwork looks very different from e each other's, and I think we celebrate that, uh, still, you know, Jill was talking about how there are two things opposite each other that she thinks about a lot. And the same goes for me. They're totally different things, but I'm also working with disparate ideas and um, visual uh, ways of expressing myself. So yes, I, I think there is, but it's not visual. And it's not even, uh, it's not even the same subject matter, but still there are, some similar things about it. And, and I'm glad that there are a lot of differences. It's much more interesting to look at her work when it's totally different than mine. Yeah, I agree. How about you, Jill? There's another aspect of the conceptual. I'm not sure it's the conceptual, but as things have evolved, we both spend years working on things. So there's a very different tempo. Um, I say different because I think that a lot of my artist friends are able to make things in a month, even an hour sometimes, so a certain kind of drawing. But I think that uh, we've set each other a model for patience and um, labor, yeah, you know, and a and kind of repetitiveness. And so maybe that's not conceptual in the way that you mean, but I think that that tempo, I really, uh, that word uh, describes a similarity between us. That's really interesting that you say the word tempo. Um, because in the essay that Anya wrote, we were talking about tempo. And when I was, um, we, we had a great process when um, working on the publication together. And we did keep talking about tempo and rhythm. And I wonder if that is, in fact, a piece of long term or dedicated friendship is feeling some kind of rhythm between each other. Um, and speaking of time. <laughs> 
I think we're gonna have to wrap it up very soon. Um, but here's another question that, I, I mean, I should be pretty simple. This is a question from Barbara and she said, have you created an artwork that celebrates your friendship? And I realize that for this show, you created both of you an artwork for your friendship. And that is the artwork that's titled that we were showing earlier called Accompanied Two Views of the Sea. And I have just a moment. Do you wanna, does anyone wanna comment on that? Marilyn, do you wanna say where it came from? And Jill, what came after? Well, I actually started the piece before we thought about this exhibit. Uh, I was in Provincetown and I had forgotten to bring art materials with me. I was there for a week. And so I bought some paper and I, I was right on the bay and I looked at it and I was sort of drawing with the thread, the ripples of the water. And after I did it, I thought a lot about the show that Jill and I were in, in the, what was it, 1980, I think, at Helen Schlein Gallery. And Jill had an installation and they looked like waves rippling. And uh, so it seemed like the perfect piece to bring together with something that Jill would do. Yeah. And then Jill, you took that drawing just this summer mm -hmm. and you made a frame for it. You made your wood piece for it. When I saw that piece of Marilyn's, I loved it. And I said, I want to make a frame because I started making frames for a lot of my drawings. And some people have asked, do we collaborate? No. We don't. And I think of that frame as a hug. Mm -hmm. I do too. <laughs> in response. And I have a house in Westport, Mass, and I go to Horseneck, Horseneck Beach almost every day. So just being in the water is what helped me to make that frame that way. So it was very much about the experience my experience, a very different physical experience, but not a collaboration. Yeah. Yeah. I really, when I said it was like surrounds and then there's a center. Yeah. I think with that, I'm going to end this program too short and thank you both. And I suppose in the last moments that we're together, I encourage the audience to visit the exhibition website so you can see the art and what we're discussing, but also don't miss the learn and more. Um, there's a button that says learn more and participate. There's some guiding questions, podcasts, reading and resources around friendship. And you can sign up to receive a copy of the publication with an essay by Anya Ventura. Do that soon because we have limited supplies. And I'm just going to do a little one of these. Read Maggie's book, The Equivalence. It's fantastic. And I suppose, finally, check in with your friends because this is the moment. And I suppose now I'll just say have a good evening, everyone. Marilyn and Jill, I hope to celebrate with you together soon. Thank you for joining.